Okay, welcome to the eighth Hands-On Agile webinar. I'm your host, Stefan Wolpes, and today we will be talking about Scrum Master anti-patterns. The Scrum Master. Before we dive into the Scrum Master anti-patterns, let's have a look at the Scrum Guide. According to the Scrum Guide, the Scrum Master is responsible for promoting and supporting Scrum, as defined in the Scrum Guide. Scrum Masters do this by helping everyone understand the theory, practices, rules, and values of Scrum. So from a team perspective, the Scrum Master is a servant leader. But the Scrum Master also helps those outside the Scrum team to understand which of their interactions are like this phrase, with the Scrum team are helpful and which are not. The Scrum Master helps everyone change these interactions to maximize the value created by the Scrum team. Sort of assistant value maximizer when compared to the product owner. But I believe the keystone of the definition of the Scrum Master role is really the servant leader aspect. In the most cases of Scrum Master anti-patterns, the individual will not be living up to the servant leader role. Let's start with my dirty dozen. Scrum Master anti-patterns, the Scrum Master by title only. Number one, the Agile Manager. I believe self-organization does not mean the absence of management. I mean, why would a Scrum team handle payroll, for example? Outsourcing of these kind of tasks to the management is common. If you'd like to learn more about this, I highly recommend that you run, for example, a delegation poker game from the Management 3.0 series, which is really helpful and uh, provides a lot of insight how your team is actually understanding the role of management. However, Scrum is by all means not about exercising command and control. The Scrum Master is by definition certainly not a supervisor. If you search the Scrum Guide, you will never find project manager or something in that direction. It simply does not exist. Typical signs of these kind of management attitudes, of Tayloristic attitudes, are, for example, providing working agreements to speed up the getting productive phase of a new team, you know? Yeah, we could run a team exercise here, but seriously, here's my suggestion for the working agreements, now get going. Or turning the daily scrum into some sort of reporting session, probably even addressing the people and giving them the right to speak. Another would be to push the team during the sprint planning to take more on that they actually would like to pull into the sprint. You know, it's not just only the product owner who's probably be tempted to go down that road. Another issue would be assigning subtasks to developers. Or even worse, an engineer turned scrum master who cannot let go and is actively participating in helping the team or maybe suggesting the team how to solve technical issues. These are all aspects of the manager inside the scrum master that needs to be addressed absolutely from my perspective and the retrospective. Number two, team secretary on scrum parent. So the scrum parent is generally shielding the team from the cold and cruel world, right? Creating a happy and safe agile bubble. Classic example of this kind of parenting behavior is, for example, dealing with all the impediments personally, although a scrum team member could handle them as well. Filtering feedback from stakeholders, particularly the negative feedback, or even cutting communication to the team mainly off. Pampering the team, for example, running errands or being the team secretary. I mean, sometimes even this might be bordering on the helper syndrome. And I think we all know this. The board needs to be updated and the Scrum Master does so. The state of the ticket needs to be synchronized with the software who's doing this, who's booking rooms, who is buying stickies, who is getting coffee, etc. These are absolutely no jobs for a Scrum Master. A Scrum parent is also preventing the team from failure whenever possible. This even tends to apply when the failure is actually a rather minor one and the team can quickly recover and is not causing any damage. The problem is if you're not failing, you're not pushing hard enough. Empiricism is based on learning and learning itself is inevitably linked to failure. Remember when you grew up as little kids, you basically learned by failure. And if the team is prevented from learning, it's not learning, it's just staying in the comfort zone, which also goes hand in hand that a scrum parent is typically not challenging the team. He or she is content if the team reaches a certain level of proficiency, the good enough approach. A scrum parent may be also setting boundaries, but is rarely enforcing them. You know, tends to tolerate damaging behavior from team member. Often futile hope that the culprit will be insightful and improve over time. The scrum parent's motto, right or wrong, my team. 
Number three, the imposter. Dollar dollar bills, yo. You know, agile scrum, this thing is a fad. And how hard can it actually be? I mean, this main manual has 70 pages or something like that. And, you know, I will weather the temporary decline in the demand for project managers by getting a scrum master certificate. This actually should have been become obvious during the recruiting process, you know, uh, interviews with team members, trial days, etc. PP. Unless your HR department defies all learnings how to hire people with an agile mindset, so peer recruiting, etc. PP. The good thing is you cannot hide greed. The conviction will bring out his or her true colors over time inevitably, and then you have to deal with it. Number four, dogmatism. Or to be precise. The Scrum Master enjoys teaching. You may have heard the Shua remodel borrowed from martial arts. So, for example, if you have read uh, Lisa Atkins Coaching Agile Teams, there's a whole chapter on that. Shua Re is basically a pattern of achieving mastery. The idea is that ultimately the student shall surpass the master. There are three stages. Shu, follow the rule. Ha, break the rule and re be the rule. The style of the scrum master is supposed to change with the phases. In the shoe phase, it's actually teaching. What does teaching mean? Teaching means teaching the rules. So the student copies the techniques as taught without modification and without attempting to understand the rationale behind them. Follow the rules way. Now the problem is that teaching feels good. Team members come to you and ask for help, so you have a purpose. People follow the rules, so you're exercising influence or even authority. And you can easily attribute the team's progress or success to your teaching. Your master of what you do. Now, the issue is to become self-organizing. The team needs to move beyond the shoe phase, right? It needs to stand on its own feet. And if the scrum master doesn't like to leave this phase, if it likes to keep the team in the shoe phase to have a, a good time teaching it, it's certainly not helpful. Typical shoe anti-pattern would be that the application of scrum is becoming mechanistic. The team is depending on the scrum master for each and everything. It's more about the scrum master than actually about the team. You know, the result is some sort of cargo called scrum. You can easily spot it if you observe it. Number five, failing at the capacity game. The Scrum Master does not address the necessity of slack time by fighting the push for 100% utilization. This often comes from the product owner or probably from the engineering management. Why aren't you taking on more story points or why aren't you taking on more stories? The problem is that technical excellence is the route to agility. I mean, just have a look at the state of DevOps report or my personal suggestion, read Accelerate by Nicole Forsgren and Jess Humble. The Scrum team's effectiveness will be significantly impeded if the team does not address technical debt every sprint. The team will also suffer if there's no time for pairing, mobbing, training, or knowledge sharing. The 100% utilization fetish always reduces the team's long-term productivity. The problem is it's not immediately visible. It's deteriorating over time. So you actually have to make this an issue as early as possible. You have to fight this 100% utilization approach from day one. And if you're not doing this, it's a slippery slope. This utilization rate of 100% is a classic Taylorist line management planking. You know, this approach of this idea of this mental model of people are lazy and are trying to rip us off. So we have to keep them occupied to get the most out of our paycheck, you know, which is completely nonsense. Number six, undermining flow. The Scrum Master allows stakeholders to disrupt the flow of the development team during the sprint. For example, the Scrum Master has a kind of laissez-faire policy as far as access to the development team is concerned. So you can hit them up anytime you like. Or the Scrum Master does not object that the management invites engineers to random meetings of subject matter experts, you know, always disrupting everything. Or the Scrum Master allows that other stakeholders or managers turn the daily Scrum into a reporting session. Preserving the flow of work through the team during the sprint is the linchpin of productivity. You know, that's why work in progress limits are so useful, you know, avoiding creating artificial cues. And there's another issue why you need to be cautious about this. If the scrum team fails, no stakeholder will read this kind of what happened during the sprint fine print afterwards. All they see is the scrum team did not deliver. And this will inevitably undermine the trust in the team. Number seven, metrics fetish. 
the Scrum Master is drawn to, to the wrong metrics. So for example, pursuing flawed metrics in the sense that the Scrum Master keeps track of individual performance metrics, such as story points per developer per sprint, no kidding, or even worse, probably reports these metrics to the person's line managers. This is a classic supervisor hack to reintroduce command and control through the back door. And again, you end up with some sort of cargo called Scrum. The Scrum Master is a burn-down chart hacker. The Scrum Master focuses his or her work on producing a daily update to the burn-down chart. If the team considers a burn-down chart useful to monitor progress toward the sprint goal, fine, then it's the job of the dev team to actually update the chart every day. However, the burn-down chart is solely maintained to track the output for reporting purposes to the engineering management. That's an issue the team should get concerned with and address in the retrospective. It's not, not intended to be that way. Number eight, ignoring Scrum values. Let's have a look at the Scrum Guide. When the Scrum values of commitment, courage, focus, openness, and respect are embodied and lived by the Scrum team, the pillars of Scrum, transparency, inspection, and adaptation, come to life and build trust for everyone. The successful use of Scrum depends on people becoming more proficient and living these five values. And you have, again, to do this from day one and you have to really keep track of this and you have to push for this and you have to probably from time to time run the retrospective and feel the scrum value beat of the team creating these spider graphics for example and uh, tracking them over time how these values evolve and then come to some action items with the team and figure out okay what can we do for example to improve the value courage that we have here if a scrum master is failing to do that, he's basically undermining all the other efforts that lead to building up trust with the stakeholders within the team and actually laying the groundwork to have a chance to continuously improve. Number nine, skipping scrum events. All scrum events are essential for a team success. You cannot skip any events. You know, it's the minimum viable list of events that you have. You can't cut anything out of that. A junior scrum team might be tempted to skip the retrospective to buy some more time to meet the sprint goal. Yeah, actually, it's not that different from last time. So do we really need to have a retrospective? If a scrum master accepts this kind of deal, he's not just, or he or she is not just only providing a disservice to the team. Actually, the proposal itself is already a sign how desperately a retrospective would be needed. The other version is that the scrum master postpones the retrospective into the next sprint. Okay, beyond this inspect and adapt aspect, the retrospective shall also serve as a moment of closure that resets everybody's mind so that the team can focus on the new sprint. That's the reason why we actually have the retrospective after the sprint review and for the sprint planning of the next sprint. If you postpone it until the next sprint, you will interrupt the flow of the team then. You know, you create an additional cognitive load by context switching. You know, you're working on something completely new and now you have to go back to the old thing. And it also delays the tackling of possible improvements. Number 10, Groundhog Day. The retrospective never changes the composition, venue, or length. In this case, the team will very likely revisit the same issues over and over again. It's a sort of Groundhog Day without the heavy ending, though, and will become or will turn the retrospective in some sort of anti-mechanistic ritual that defies the purpose of it. So what can you do about this? First of all, start with a repository of exercises for all the five stages and never run the same retrospective twice. There's an endless number of permutations how you can set up a retrospective. It's really not rocket surgery. If you need ideas what to do during the retrospective, use Retromart or Tasty Cupcakes, or be creative yourself, visit liberating structures or training from the back of the room. There are endless possibilities to handcraft retrospectives that really are meaningful. Do so by also talking to your fellow Scrum Masters at the organization. And if you're the sole Scrum Master in the organization, why don't you join the Hands-On Agile Slack group? Because it's really an active community and you will get plenty of input where to find things and how to do that. A simple way to spice up your retrospective is to change venues. And, you know, humans are creatures of habit. And they feel like comfort when it's always the same space that you run the retrospective. Well, just change it. Go somewhere else. Go outside if it's summer. Take a completely different venue, you know. Push the people out of their comfort zone, you know. Make them alert again. 
you know, appeal to the old part of the brain that's looking for the saber-toothed tiger lurking around the corner trying to hunt you down. And why not theme retrospectives? I mean, why not have a Halloween perspective? You know, get dressed up, uh, wear costumes, wear makeup, and generously spread uh, artificial spider nets, and you will see the retrospective will have a completely different taste. So there's no need to uh, have a Groundhog Day with retrospectives. Absolutely not. And by the way, I tend to spend a whole day per sprint on preparing, running, and actually following up with a retrospective. And it's a very good day invested. Number 11, manager alert. The Scrum Master permits stakeholders or worse, uh, line managers to participate in the team retrospective. There are plenty of reasons why stakeholders are interested to get in a closer contact with the team. So besides the sprint review, there's basically no other event planned in Scrum that stakeholders talk directly with the whole Scrum team. However, including them or inviting them to the team retrospective is a no-go and the team should refuse to participate in that. But there are plenty of alternatives. Why don't you run a separate overall retrospective with stakeholders? Or maybe other scrum ceremonies are suited for that too. I mean, of course, it's a sprint review, but there's ample room for stakeholders participating in the daily scrums. You know, chickens are always allowed to listen in. And I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be participating, for example, in a backlog refinement or in a sprint planning, as long as they don't try to influence the meeting itself. On top of that, there are plenty of opportunities to have a conversation. I mean, at the water cooler, over coffee, during lunchtime, just think about this. There's ample opportunity to make this kind of communication happen in a structured way. There's one tricky situation, though. What if the line manager serves also on the Scrum team? For example, my last project, we had the case that some uh, one of the developers was promoted to a managerial position and he became the line manager of two other developers of the same team. So that was a really tricky situation and I recommend to avoid them at all costs because it undoubtedly has negative impact on the quality of the retrospectives. Think of the scrum values like courage and openness, they certainly will be affected. Number 12, the frustrated scrum master. What if your scrum master is just frustrated? Imagine he or she has been working his or her butt off for months, but the team is not responding to the effort. You know, this pearls before swine syndrome. In my experience, good scrum masters are in for the purpose. They want to have impact. Hence, the level of frustration is growing over time if nothing is happening. There are a lot of potential reasons for a failure at this level. So, for example, the lack of sponsoring from the C-level of the organization. A widespread belief that Agile is just the latest management fad that's ignorable. The team composition is wrong. There is no psychological safety to address problems within the team or the organization. The organization has no failure culture. So learning by failure is merely a lip service. The company culture does not value transparency. Our individual team members harbor personal agendas unaligned with the team objectives. You know, so incentives are based on the individual, not on the team. So there are endless possibilities why a scrum master may be in a bad psychological shape. And this is a moment, I believe, when we should all turn to our scrum master and sub provide support and help because without cooperation of the team, he or she might not be able to get out of there. Let me quickly wrap up the Dirty Dozen Scrum Master Anti-Patterns. We started with the Agile Manager, the Taylorist at heart. We then moved on to the Scrum Mom. Then we stopped over at the Imposter. Then we joined the Dogmatic Teacher who likes to stay at the shoe phase because he or she enjoys teaching. Then we had the failure at the capacity team. So some terrorist elements are pushing for 100% utilization and the Scrum Master is not fighting against that. Then we have the case of stakeholders undermining the flow during the sprint. The Scrum Master, him or herself, becomes obsessed with certain metrics. He or she is not valuing or putting attention to the scrum values or even may consider skipping events like retrospectives. 
Speaking of retrospectives, retrospectives are boring like hell because it's Groundhog Day, same procedure all the, every time and people get bored to death. Then we have the manager or stakeholder alert. So the Scrum Master allows the intervention of other people into the team matters. And finally, give it some thought. Maybe your Scrum Master is just frustrated because there is no progress and the system is pushing back and he or she needs support. So this was the 8th Hands on Agile webinar on Scrum Master Anti-Patterns. Thanks a lot for your attendance. And if you'd like to join me again, you can do so on November 6th. And we will be talking about sprint review anti-patterns. <laughs>